Which is completely topical in this, <laughs> in this environment because we just had a little bit of friction trying to get the slides working, but we're here now. Quite good. Okay, friction. It's a bit of a funny word, don't you think? We might associate it with terms like irritation, agitation, bop, resistance, a little bit of tension, or an obstacle, blockers, something that get in our way, even chafing. Yikes. <laughs> well, you know what? Friction has a bit of a rebranding project ahead of it. And this is what we're going to do in this talk today. Because I believe that friction can be freaking good. To believe this, we need to challenge some of the things that we are holding as firm beliefs of what friction is currently. So here's what we're going to do. Step one, we are going to temporarily forget everything we know about friction. We're gonna do an unlearn and heck and get there. Oh, sorry, we're, gonna, we're not going to unlearn every, everything about that. We're going to unlearn everything about design basics and what we know about friction. Step two, looking at examples of where friction can do some good things. Step three, we're going to talk about dogs. Really? And lastly, <laughs> In step four, we're going to throw some shade, but also see how we might be able to change the world using friction in a short 30 minute talk. Totally possible. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's look at this first step. Unlearning what we know about design 101. So I want you to just kind of blank page, forget it all, because the call that I have to you all at the moment is as devs, designers, creators, makers in this world. We're tasked with making websites and products as easy to use as possible, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do this through methods like simplifying the steps, removing unnecessary clicks, listening to our customers. But I want you to forget all of that. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to do the absolute opposite and this is what it's going to feel like. I wonder if this is gonna work. Well, the sound doesn't work. Imagine the sound to go with it. <laughs> but we are going to do all of the considered anti-patterns. We're going to create obstacles. We're going to add more steps. We're going to be seriously annoying, unorthodox, and ignore all of the feedback from our users. And you might be thinking, Padma, that seems like odd advice. And you're right. <laughs> it seems like I'm suggesting a bunch of anti-patterns, bad UX practices, and here's the bingo card to prove it. However, we're in a time in tech, I'm sure you all agree with me, that it's a really interesting growth time for us. We're building things and shipping things that are designed to be easier, faster, more automated. But easier to use doesn't necessarily mean better. So by interrupting and slowing people down, this could actually be something that can improve the way that we're shaping the world. So stay with me on this one. Let's explore this notion and look at examples of when friction has done some pretty good stuff. The first example might be one that's quite familiar to you all. Something like a warning prompt, or I hope it's familiar to you all, something like a warning prompt or alert that you might see it's probably the most common pattern, like a pop-up, dialog box, modal. With this interruption, this pattern double checks whether you're extra sure that you actually want to do the thing. This interruption then becomes a good pattern, right? Because it's helping prevent a potential error, a mistake, an accident. Something that potentially is unreversible, undoable, irrecoverable, like erasing permanently. GitHub take this a step further, and I love it. Like seriously love it. They've added in so many obstacles, several obstacles to prevent you from accidentally deleting a repo by adding hurdles upon hurdles. And so let's see what they do in action. 
This is great, a whole danger zone section before you do it. And then this archive, this re repository uh, as, a, as a potential alternative option, right? So it's not as destructive as fully deleting. And then when you go to delete this repo, repo uh, you get this gate that comes up, you need to understand the thing, and then you read and understand these effects. Then you have to type in the whole path and get it correct before you get the, even the button to be active. All right, these are quite a few steps. Then on top of that, you get an SMS confirmation to say, are you sure you want to do this? Seems irreversible. Um, but then all of these gates, right? It makes it so much harder to make a mistake. You can't just go off in autopilot and unconsciously just do something that you go, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. I would actually say it's a perfect amount of friction for this type of action and it's quite appropriate. Irritating, but I like it. So yeah, let's interrupt the user flow. Let's be obtrusive, make people think. Let's have more clicks, multiple steps. Funny side story. I wasn't sure if I was going to include this or not, but as I was going to take some screencasts of the deletion flow that I would have used in a previous example, Help Scout, as an example, used to have this friction point in place where you would have to type delete to confirm deleting person. Over the weekend, I went in to test this to take a screencast to include in the talk and accidentally deleted one of the pet rescue team members. <laughs> Whoopsie. It was the awkward uh, SMS uh, and follow-up call just to make sure they knew they weren't being secretly off-boarded. <laughs> Whew. Help Scout, please add that feature back in. <laughs> All right, back on track. How about in a different way then, when it's not necessarily a destructive action uh, that is something that maybe is critical or important, something you might want to pay attention to, like setting your alarm. Sleep Cycle, as an example, they have a just a, a little prompt that comes up to ask whether you're sure that you want to set a time in the PM. Of course, this is pretty, pretty clever if you actually don't want to be getting up in the afternoon or the evening. Uh, and say, for example, if you had to go and catch a flight on time in the morning, you, it prevents that whoopsie moment, that accidental thing. It's just a very micro, micro gate that helps prevent that. Speaking of flights, here's another example. Again, you might be familiar with this, but Virgin Australia's check-in process has a really interesting approach to this friction because they use a distracting visual pattern being that their brand colour is red and red often means no error or, you know, go back or the rest or cancel. And the non-intuitive double take to go, am I pressing the red button or the green button to proceed with yes or no, in that affirmative moment where you are pausing, it's, it's actually quite important because you don't want to make a mistake there and be pulled up at the security gate with your Marmite coming through. <laughs> it's a critical gate requiring action. Okay, checkpoint. We've covered some common patterns of friction uh, and at least the patterns of anti-patterns that I've discussed, like pop-ups, so I'm saying yes, use pop-ups, uh, modals, dialog boxes, uh, and also input fields, right? And while I was in, uh, running through these examples, I introduced a couple of terms that we can start to neatly group them into. First level was gates. Gates to pre prevent these errors, mistakes, and accidents. So that's that basic tier of friction. The next level, which we started to explore in the GitHub example, was this next tier that requires even additional effort because they're providing more hurdles for you to go through as part of that process, more steps, but making it even harder to make that mistake. Excellent, good obstacles. The next tier is a place that's really, really super interesting to me. It weaves in more complexity and behavior change as an opportunity and introduces things like product and design ethics, really cool conversations to be having. With detours, we can create action bypasses to do awesome things like protecting people, adding value to products, nudging for different behaviors and influencing for change or nudging towards alternative paths. So let's explore these. A really simple example, um, and they can be really quite subtle uh, when, we, when we come across them. Duolingo uses this in a business sense. 
they tested out how friction as a point of making selecting your learning goal a mandatory feature as opposed to pre-selecting, so they ran these tests alongside each other, actually found that the outcomes and the KPIs that they were looking towards um, did, did an amazing, you know, uh, yielded amazing results. So they saw retention go up massively, users selected higher goals than before, users did not dis drop off despite that friction point, and users retained for weeks after seeing this screen. These are really good business points of adding value, and it's that point of, yeah, we did interrupt the user and we did force them to perform extra actions, which if we went back to basics, that might have been something that was a deterrent. And in Slack's example, it's a whoopsie preventer. In case you weren't aware from that social responsibility view that you were going to be notifying hundreds of people with the at, uh, and in, in that process, they did it right at that correct time where you could rethink whether that was the path that you wanted to take or whether you wanted to take a detour. So that social responsibility that comes just subtly through that, that journey is such a, such a great one to avoid unintended actions. And with Airbnb, this one's really, really interesting. Um, I find that the way that Airbnb weaves through detours and friction throughout all of their work in different ways is a really fascinating space. So they do it to increase their product engagement, building trust and increasing satisfaction and sentiment. And in a very prime and simple example that we're just used to as the pattern now is that they connect travellers up with the host to be able to discuss things like requests or uh, complaints, complaints handling, uh, and being able to ask questions and address any concerns. Even though Airbnb have a very, you know, a customer care team who would have been trained specifically in that customer care discipline, they connected, Airbnb decided to connect the person, the traveler and the host together to resolve this ultimately conflict friction. The results, satisfaction went up. This is because the action built into the trust, into the conversations of the person at the other end, that there was an intention of wanting to resolve this and finding an outcome together. This kind of friction point is, you know, it didn't have to go through a filter of a customer care team. It went through directly with two humans to just ask the question and have a resolution. So that's so, so interesting. And even that fact that it uh, had better, yielded really excellent results in their satisfaction scores. All right, so friction is already everywhere, right? And if I haven't convinced you to start applying friction in your projects that you work, or you know, the projects or you work on Monday, that's okay, I still have another 15 minutes to do it. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> All right. It goes without saying that I'm definitely not encouraging patterns of dark friction. I'm not encouraging you to make it difficult for someone to close an app with a, with a gate. And I'm certainly not encouraging anyone to make it more difficult or harder to cancel a subscription or payments. I'm not going to name brands. Anyway, <laughs> if you work there, help. <laughs> Anyway, we're at the exciting bit. Okay, we are going to obviously talk about dogs now, obviously, getting excited. Specifically how designing, uh, designing with friction can ultimately help dogs. Okay. You excited? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the work that we're doing at Pet Rescue really quick so that you have the context. We have around 8,000 homeless dogs, homeless pets rather, sorry, there's lots of species, listed for adoption across Australia at often any given time. Counter to that, we have around 25,000 daily visitors, give or take. Everyone's looking to adopt, everyone's looking to find their best friend and additions to their families. So here we've got this really perfect opportunity to provide all pets the best chance at being seen and loved adopted, find a family. Pets like Balu or Vardy, who currently are available for adoption if anyone wants to, you know, just <laughs> chat to me. <laughs> 
So how might we be able to do deliberately and intentfully designing friction to help these two cuties get a chance at being considered? I'm going to tell you how. Don't worry. <laughs> More context. People coming to pet rescue are often looking for specific breeds because they want a pet that behaves or has a specific personality trait uh, that they're looking for. Fair. That makes perfect sense, um, but has a little bit of myth busting to be done. The research shows us that breed alone is not a successful indicator of how a pet might act or behave, their energy levels, and there's certainly no such thing as the very awesomely marketed term of hyperallergenic pet. Talk to me about that later. So when we look at a typical dog search journey flow, it's, you know, the intuitive approach, the expected and frictionless approach. There's a couch in my way. <laughs> Someone would go search, select species, select a breed, get the breeds as the search results, adopt the dog in the most simplest form, of course. Ultimately, when they find a dog to fall in love with and, you know, call their best friend and adopt, that is a really positive, awesome outcome but we like to do things just a little bit differently at Pet Rescue and we like to think about long-term working at scale and how that ripple effect that Michael was talking about before might actually come into play here. So, we add in a deliberate detour and it's a pain in the butt for so many people. We skip the ability for people to be able to search for dogs by breed. Through this, we introduce the opportunity of discoverability. Experience the chance of falling in love with a pet you weren't expecting. The serendipitous moments. This results in different looking dogs being able to have equity, not just equality, equity, and a chance to be seen or discovered amongst a sea of probably typically popular or fashionable dogs at that given time. And fashion, of course, we know changes. We see it whether it's in the shows we watch, we see it in, you know, um, online and social media. So these are all things that influence popularity of dogs. But here it is. This is why we don't have breed search at Pet Rescue. And nor do we have breed labels as well, because labels are a little dangerous when we come to stereotypes even though the feature is in high demand. And I don't say that lightly. We get hundreds and thousands of requests and suggestions from really caring, awesome folks wanting to have a specific breed of dog. And we've essentially just ignored them. <laughs> I say it with love. Um, look, it's not a technical limitation. It is so easy for us to switch that on as a feature. But here it is, I suppose, you know, that, that thing of, you know, but why? Why wouldn't you just make it, uh, well, just add the feature. Everyone wants it. Why ignore your users? Why do the anti-pattern? If it results in a pet getting adopted anyway, isn't that good? And then they find a home, regardless of what they look like, just give the people what they want. And so the current status <laughs> is if you hear the sirens coming, it's just the design police coming for me, you'll have to find a way to hide me, shove me under the cushions or something. Um, <laughs> but I've still got time to finish off my point, so it's all good. We're going deep. Put your seatbelts on, let's go for a ride. One of the many challenges we face is that the social desirability of dogs is very different. This is impacted by societal factors and the world around us. We're using that unconscious bias, things that we're aware of and unaware of, implicit, explicit. Just purely off looks alone, we might judge or assume, oh wait, let's take a step back. We might look at these pictures and go, oh, yes. Yes, we did, right? We went, oh. Um, we might judge or assume though, things like their temperament, friendliness, behavior, socialization, energy levels, health, intelligence, even their worth. 
Things like their price, their value. There's some pretty big labels to attach, right? And generalizations, especially if inaccurate and based purely on looks and appearances alone, can potentially do more harm than good. Again, the modern research shows us that breed alone is definitely not a good indicator of any of these factors that we were just exploring before. So if we had a breed search in, this would have provided an avenue to perpetuate this potential belief. And it would have prevented us from making long-term progress into the future. And that would be such a shame because in society, imagine if we did that with gender or with people of color or race. Oh wait, that would be awkward. But our bias, it's called unconscious bias for a reason as well. So that's why when we talk about things, then we can make them conscious and we can look at them and see what, how they impact how our decisions and our, you know, and our, our biases applied might impact humans and pets and the world around us. So for the pets that we're talking about, this affects their chance to find love and find a home. Going back to this method that we use in friction as the detour, we remove the perpetuation of breeds as labels. We normalize the serendipity and unexpected experiences and means that we can focus on the individual individuality, big word, uh, and the special unique personality of each individual pet, just like we would as each individual human in this room. Totally would have been so much more convenient and we would have had so many less tickets come through the support desk um, if we just added breed. But it's convenience at what cost is the question. Without this detour or bypass, we wouldn't have seen these amazing stories come through and even folks in the room, I've spoken to a few of you who have just ever so proudly showed me pictures of your pets. These serendipitous moments might not have occurred had everyone been very narrow in what they wanted in a pet that they, of how they appeared. Stories like this where people are often surprised uh, you know, uh, imagining themselves with different pets. And Mina was an example of this. She grew up with small dogs all her life and imagined just having a small dog to, you know, to cuddle up with and carry around. And she now has two very large buffers and is the happiest person ever. This is a happy family. The second beautiful story is Mish finding a best friend in Stanley, letting us know, letting us know that breed wasn't even an indicator in the search because she knew it wasn't an indicator. And this, my friends, is the social proof, why we, why we resisted, why we were sticks in the mud for it, why we said no. Because social proof, although slowly but gradually, it can be shortly. We just have to persist. Okay, if we'd added the, added the breed filter, many of these people and pets might not have had the same outcome. And they would have missed out. So, last little bit. This takes us to step four. Time to change the world. Yeah. Not everyone will have the same call to cause as what we do at Pet Rescue and in the work that we do. But how might you be able to, in the work that you're currently doing, influence change, influence thinking differently and have a, having a think about how that positive power of friction could be able to create some more positive outcomes in the world around you? So we're going to hold on to this principle of convenience at what cost? Because, I'm going to read out this quote, we need to see ourselves as gatekeepers of what we're bringing into the world and what we choose to not bring in the world, said wise Mike Montero. And I agree with this sentiment wholeheartedly. <laughs> We've automated our world, haven't we? It's, it's the very goal of it to make things quicker, faster, easier, more convenient. And we as humans are potentially on a bit of autopilot. Driverless, driverless cars. Have we designed a world that is in a completely unconscious state? Friction could potentially help interrupt this and help people to regain consciousness and take agency of their choices again. Control and agency over your own choices. Essentially what I'm saying, translated, is be like Gandalf Cat, 
and say, you shall not pass when something just looks a bit janky that could negatively impact other people, even yourself. Of course, the idea of better is relative, right? Better for who? For how long? For the business? For the company you're working for? Uh, for the clients? Great, you know, if, if, we're, if we've got goals and we've got our KPIs or the OKRs, we're working towards, you know, uh, consistently iterating and optimising and making things faster, better, more performant. All makes sense. But when we're working to business metrics like consumption or time on page or how many pages viewed, and they're the measurements that are the success indicators, this naturally then becomes suggestions like autoplay and infinite scrolling because they're increasing those specific metrics. Instagram Reels, TikTok, YouTube, Netflix, right? All built off consumption as the business model. But what's the collective impact of these metrics? Here the absence of friction could potentially be detrimental without us realizing because we were looking in that shorter term frame. So designing better, but let's do it better for the long term. Again, in that near-term or short-sighted approach, pet rescue could have absolutely included breed search easily, and it would have been just there in the platform and pets would have been adopted. Great. But we weren't prepared to compromise on that long-term goal for us because we want to create long-term social change. We want to work towards this mission that we're working towards. That's our business goal. So I mentioned at the start of this talk that I wanted us to consider building products better as opposed to just easier to use. A few more examples. Friction can help with protecting people. And I mentioned Netflix earlier, and then I'm going to highlight them as a good example as well, because they, although designed for binging and consumption, of course, you know, it's, a, it's an on-demand platform designed to hold your attention. The, the gate, that comes up after a time of inactivity and that interruption prompt to check if you're still watching after a certain time might go against the overall KPIs of how long has someone sat there and consumed. And there are, there's a business case for it, but I'll put that to the side for the moment because there's a business case that can be made for anything really. But we could see how this is a potential interruption that is good for someone to give them the chance of that detour to say, oh, maybe, maybe I do want to get up and do something else. Maybe, uh, well, I fell asleep and maybe I should just go to bed. It's a detour and it's an interruption and it regains our consciousness because we have to interact. Even TikTok provided a human safety measure uh, only recently, I think only the last couple of years, um, to prompt to check on whether the human might like to take a break after that infinite scrolling that they'd been doing. And so again, I asked you to consider the alternative path and someone in the team said, let's make the case for this. And then there's a business case for all of the cases that can be made for ethical cases. Again, Michael mentioned that team, the theme of the ripple effect and what happens in that long term and not knowing what those micro actions might impact at the time you're making them. But if they're done with that good intention, it can pulse out. And I really want us to all t walk away today and you know just have a ponder about that. Because some things are so important, they shouldn't be frictionless. Michael really made me think of this sliding seal. <laughs> It's mainly these things that require gates, detours, hurdles and prompts, all of it. And as makers in the room, we're all responsible for this and we all have a chance to, you know, to, to communicate this, to advocate for this and to get our freak on. <laughs> it's freaking good. Um, you also have the chance to advise those around you just to, you know, kind of consider, consider an alternative. Add it to your project scopes. Yeah, add it, to your, add it to your budgets, add it to your acceptance criteria. Why not have that moment of reflection of what, you know, whether there's enough friction as opposed to is it too frictionful, frictionless, that one. So today I encourage you to come out of autopilot, observe, challenge the frictionless world that we're living in, in the work that you're doing, in the products that you're consuming and paint the world with more friction. So take this bingo card, Make the world a better place, one irritating gate 
hurdle, detour at a time, because today ripples out into the future. So yes, please be annoying, be irritating, embrace chafing, do all the things. Thank you very much. Please scan this for uh, more things. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Fatima. We, we have questions, a couple that we can get through, I think, a couple of related ones. Now, how do you determine which attributes you remove from your search? And you, you allow search by species, but not by breed. So what's the kind of driving factor behind that? Are we sitting down? Are we? we can sit. Oh, okay. We can have a little sit. <laughs> it's a cool cush. It's nice. Okay, can you ask?